Thanks everybody for joining us again. Uh, we're gonna do a deeper dive on the management of NeoA, non-operative management of NeoA, and also look a little bit at the single injection hyaluronic acids uh, that have now recently come onto the market. So here are my disclosures for you to review. So we're gonna explore the use of single injection HAs in the treatment algorithm for OA. We're gonna identify patient and treatment factors that predict a favorable response uh, for HA treatments and guide uh, treatment selection. And then we can look at the differences in efficacy, the science and clinical applications uh, of the various uh, HA products that are out there. So obviously in the context of COVID, there are a lot of issues that we need to address and so some of those issues are listed here. And these are the patients that really are going to be struggling with managing their NeoA, especially the ones that may have more uh, severe disease uh, that have struggled all along and actually are ready for surgery. But obviously now we have uh, different factors that are coming into play. So I've got a number of patients who had to cancel their total knee replacements. I've had older patients or patients with significant comorbidities that are sick or scared uh, to have surgery and they want to wait until it's all over. Uh, we've had patients that are COVID positive that can't have surgery and have to get it rescheduled and then get to the back of the queue, if you will. We've got high risk patients that want surgery. So do we do those uh, cases uh, despite knowing what's going on and, and potential uh, transmission of the virus uh, if they're exposed at the hospital or in the community at physical therapy or what have you? Or do we simply say, no, you can't have the surgery and we just manage them the best we can? As patients that live in rural communities uh, where access is shut off or diminished, how do we treat them? And obviously there's a big push to move a lot of these surgeries out of the inpatient setting uh, to the outpatient setting. So if that happens, uh, are the ambulatory facilities ready for uh, patients that may need to stay more than one day? Pain control obviously is a big deal in terms of transitioning from an inpatient to an outpatient setting. If you're in an ambulatory surgery center, you can't have ER readmissions. That gets really scrutinized uh, very closely. And then postoperative complications, again, uh, scrutinized very closely. So you have to pay attention to these outcome variables that are, are important, but may not have been necessarily top of mind, or you may not have paid attention to as closely uh, in the traditional uh, inpatient paradigm. We know OA is changing and it's uh, becoming uh, much more prevalent uh, in our younger patients. It's moving to the left and you can see the trend here uh, of uh, patients developing OA is really growing, especially in the 45 to 64 year old uh, age range. You know, and it's not uncommon for me to be doing a knee replacement in someone who's 50, 55 years old, whereas 10, 15 years ago, I think there would have been a food fight at our indications conference uh, if you were going to do a knee replacement in someone who's 50. It just wasn't done. But now it's almost commonplace, or not commonplace, but it's, it's not unusual for us to be doing uh, these surgeries. Now, we can look at the growing uh, uh, numbers of NeoA. Uh, in a couple different uh, contexts. We can blame it on uh, increase in population, right? So that explains for uh, about 11% of the growth. We can blame it on obesity. That explains about 23% of the growth. But there's still a significant number of patients who are developing a way where we don't necessarily have a clear epidemiologic explanation uh, for why that growth is there. If we look at the number of total joint replacements, it is growing uh, significantly. You can see uh, the number here uh, in the Medicare patients. Uh, where uh, the number of total hip and uh, revision total knee replacement patients is growing significantly. And actually, as an orthopedic surgeon, as a total joint surgeon, uh, the revision burden is uh, just as concerning uh, for me because we're slowly losing uh, the number of surgeons that are willing or able to handle uh, the revision burden. And so as the primary total knee replacement volume grows, you know, what happens to that revision burden as well? If we look at a different model, uh, modeling out and projecting out how many total joint replacement patients uh, we'll be seeing, you can see there's a significant uh, increase projected out to 2030 uh, in the most recent uh, uh, projections uh, that uh, have been done, uh, again, using uh, the uh, insurance data uh, that uh, is available. So why do we see this growth or what are some of the things around NeoA that makes it difficult uh, for cartilage to heal? I think the two biggest issues or the two most practical uh, problems are the fact that cartilage is avascular and aneural. So it's avascular, so it has very poor reparative potential and it's aneural. So you really can't feel it as cartilage is being damaged, which is a good and bad thing. You can't feel it, so you can't tell it's being damaged. But if you could feel it, you'd probably uh, scream in pain every time you took a step. 
right? One of the key factors is this uh, 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 constituent of articular cartilage called glycosaminoglycans. So this is a molecule within cartilage that gives it its compressibility and its ability to absorb shock and absorb shear and compressive uh, stress. And so as we age, the size of these molecules diminish and the concentration of these molecules diminish. And this is where hyaluronic acid really fits in and is a potential target. If we look at OA, it's a very complex biological process. So it's not simply wear and tear, mechanical destruction of the articular cartilage and of the bone and of the ligaments. You can see here, there's a complex interplay of cytokines and chemokines and all kinds of cellular mechanisms and cascades that are happening that are driving away. So there's a lot of biology going on here. It's not just simply your uh, tires uh, wearing out on your car, if you will. And so this is a depiction of some of the cell signaling and some of the cellular uh, mechanisms uh, that are impactful around managing NEOA. So you can see here uh, what uh, kind of grossly it looks like. Uh, the, you've got the smooth uh, hyaline cartilage that co coats the end of the uh, joint. And as uh, OA sets in, you can see it starts becoming rough. And so as the cartilage begins to degrade, you have a biological process on top of a mechanical process. And so it kind of just uh, perpetuates indefinitely until you can uh, break that cycle. So this is uh, from a couple of knee scopes that I did. This is a healthy knee. You can see the smooth white articular cartilage here on the femur, and then compare that to this arthritic knee where you can see all that articular cartilage worn away. This pink stuff is actual bone, so completely a worn out articular cartilage. The meniscus here all chewed up, looks like somebody uh, took a weed whacker to it. So I think one of the big challenges in diagnosing and managing NEOA is number one, getting the severity of the disease uh, appropriately. And so the key to that is getting the appropriate x-ray. And one of the x-rays that routinely gets ignored or in the non-ortho world uh, is, is not known is getting the notch view or the tunnel view or the Rosenberg view. And this is uh, an AP x-ray with the knee flex at about 45 degrees. So you can really bring into profile that portion of the femur where you would expect the articular cartilage to be worn out, which would be the posterior condyles. So my routine x-rays that I get uh, when I have a new patient with chronic knee away is this. So I get a merchant view or sunrise view. So we're getting the patella sitting in the trochlear groove on profile. I get a lateral view. I get a standing AP knee x-ray and I get a standing notch view or tunnel view uh, like I described. And this is where the patient flex about 45 degrees. And so what that does is bring into profile that area of the knee where we expect that cartilage to where cartilage where to be. So this is the same exact patient, okay? I had them stand and took a standard AP knee x-ray. Then I had them do the tunnel view or the notch view. And look what happened. That medial joint space completely collapsed because we're bringing into profile that area of the knee where we would expect that articular cartilage to wear out. So this x-ray you could grade as possibly a KL2, call it mild, maybe moderate knee away. This is a bone on bone patient uh, x-ray. So this patient, I probably would have treated with NSAIDs. This patient actually may need a joint replacement, right? And so if we don't get the appropriate x-rays, what do we do? We then inappropriately treat in the patients. And then when this patient doesn't necessarily respond to our treatment plan, what do we end up doing? We start blaming the patient, right? They're a malingerer or it's the patient or, you know, super tentorial or what have you. The issue is we don't want to look in the mirror and realize that actually we didn't diagnose them appropriately. This is another uh, example of an x-ray put fall. Uh, the, the problem with getting supine x-ray ver versus standing x-rays. So this is the same exact patient. Uh, they came to me uh, with their x-rays on a CD and I asked the patient, were you standing or laying down? And they said they were laying down. And so this was the x-ray they handed me. I redid the x-rays in my office and I asked them to stand and lo and behold, what do we see? So when I had them stand, we had complete collapse of the articular surface. So when you order the x-rays, you have to really explain to the uh, uh, radiology tech, techs or the imaging center that you're sending the patient to exactly what you're looking for. So you want weight bearing x-rays, I want an AP x-ray and a notch view, I want a sunrise view or a tunnel view to see what's going on with the patella because oftentimes you'll have severe uh, patellofemoral arthritis that you won't pick up on the standard AP or lateral knee x-ray. 
And so next time you're uh, flying and you're on Delta and you're uh, looking at the back of the magazine and you can see uh, someone's using lasers or magnets or something to regrow cartilage, you now can appreciate what they were doing. Uh, they took the same exact x-ray uh, with the patient laying down and standing and magically uh, grew their cartilage uh, to convince you to use this uh, new uh, innovative technology. So this is a, a, a picture that I took during surgery and you can see right here where that wear is. Right? It's along the posterior condyle of the femur. And when we're taking an AP knee x-ray, this is what we're imaging. We're not imaging this posterior aspect. When we take that notch view, this is the aspect of the femur that we're bringing into profile. And there's plenty of literature and science out there demonstrating that the notch view is actually more sensitive and better for assessing severity of disease than the standing AP knee x-ray. So once we've diagnosed knee away, what are our treatment options? So the traditional paradigm is this, right? And this is what's stuck for many, many years. It's using arthritis pills, Advil, Aleve, Motrin, Tylenol, what have you. If those don't work, then we move on to steroids. And if those don't work, then we move on to surgery. So the challenge here is introducing everybody and allowing them to understand that there are a lot more treatment options that are out there beyond the simple paradigm that we've been working in uh, for so long. And so this is a treatment pyramid that I, I like to show. And so we start especially with early OA, with these simple treatments here, exercise, physical therapy, weight loss, so on and so forth. As arthritis progressive, we start getting more aggressive with simple analgesics more, uh, and then we start using prescriptive uh, treatments, and then we start getting the more interventional treatments, uh, such as uh, blocking geniculate nerves, uh, injections, prescription strength, uh, anti-inflammatories, uh, so on and so forth, and then ultimately surgery. And HA injections, you can see, are best utilized when we're talking about mild to moderate NEOA. And a lot of the recent literature and a lot of recent information supports the fact that HA injections work best uh, when we use them with mild to moderate uh, arthritis. So this is a nice uh, algorithm uh, out of the uh, one of the rheumatology journals that really highlights all the options that are out there and if you're not familiar with this, this may be one where you just simply want to photocopy and tape at your uh, desk. Uh, and that way you have a reference uh, as you see these patients. So you know where to start and kind of work through all the different treatment options that are out there. So I've been talking about HA injections. And so what exactly are HA? So hyaluronin is a polysaccharide found in all tissues and body fluids of vertebrates, as well as in some bacteria. It's interesting because it's one of the very few molecules that's completely preserved across all animal species. So if you can preserve it, you can actually move it between species without any issue. So whether it's a rooster or bacteria or whatever into a human. So if I can purify it, I can actually use it and the body will recognize it as being normal. So it's a linear polymer of exceptional molecular weight of multiple kilodaltons. It's abundant in loose connective tissue. It's synthesized in the cellular plasma membrane. Uh, it binds to the proteoglycans to stabilize the structure of the extracellular, ma uh, extracellular uh, matrix. And so it's found intrinsically within the knee joint. And like I said, as OA progresses, the concentration and the size of that molecule uh, diminishes over time. And one of the big uh, changes uh, that we see is your articular alteration structural changes uh, within the knee. And so the subchondral bone, when that subchondral bone starts seeing those uh, forces, that's when we, the patients start seeing or start feeling the pain and the dysfunction uh, associated with uh, knee OA. So what are the mechanisms of action for HA treatment in osteoarthritic knee? So there's data showing that it can actually help protect the articular cartilage or the chondrocytes. It helps stimulate the body to make more normal endogenous uh, proteoglycans and glycosaminoglycans or HA. It's got anti-inflammatory properties. It's got mechanical modifications. So again, if you can stabilize your articular cartilage, it will help uh, mechanically uh, with the knee. Uh, potentially can help with the subchondral bone, which is where you feel a lot of the pain because remember that's where the nerve endings are. And so as the cartilage wears away, uh, the next uh, a really structural component is the subchondral bone. And that's where the nerves are, which is why the patients begin uh, feeling pain. And it's got analgesic effects as well. So in terms of chondral protection, uh, it uh, has a significant data around its ability to reduce or uh, uh, improve uh, inflammation and thereby uh, reducing the matrix metallic proteinases, which are the degradative enzymes that attack the articular cartilage and break down the articular cartilage. 
Again, as I mentioned, uh, the uh, synthesis of protoglycans and glycosaminoglycans, uh, enabling the knee or the synovium to produce more normal endogenous uh, HA and its anti-inflammatory effects. Again, hat in hand with MMP uh, because it's those uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines that drive the MMPs that then drive the uh, destructive uh, uh, processes that we see with articular cartilage. And all of this happens through the CD44 uh, receptor. Um, the viscous nature of HAs has been shown to lubricate the joint capsule, and we think that uh, degeneration potentially uh, can be prevented uh, via this reduction in friction. And believe it or not, actually, this is one of the primary uh, approvals that the FDA allowed to bring HAs to the market. HA injections are actually considered a device by the FDA, believe it or not, and it was because of these initial mechanical properties uh, that the FDA felt that this was actually a device, but uh, that has uh, since changed and the, HA, uh, the FDA is thinking about this a little differently. But needless to say today uh, and in the past, actually uh, HA injections are actually considered a device uh, by the regulatory bodies here uh, in the US. You can see uh, the HA injections uh, help uh, with the subchondral uh, bone. Uh, again, that's where uh, a lot of the pain uh, potentially can be derived from. Uh, and it's got uh, uh, potential analgesic effects. We look at animal models. Uh, if you harvest the dorsal root ganglion in animals that were exposed to HA, you see a down regulation in uh, pain receptors uh, at the uh, CNS level uh, as well. Uh, so both centrally and then also uh, peripherally. So you can see clinically that uh, there's a significant uh, re uh, improvement in the behavior of articular cartilage uh, in patients that receive uh, HA injections uh, compared to patients that don't. Uh, when we take uh, 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 urine samples uh, from patients that received HA versus patients that did not, you see a reduction in cartilage breakdown uh, proteins and molecules in the patients that received HA injections compared to uh, the patients that uh, did not. When we look uh, uh, in vitro also uh, and clinically uh, at its ability or at the body's ability to produce uh, more normal uh, protoglycans and glucosaminoglycans, you can see uh, both uh, with ultrasound and with histo uh, that the patient's able to produce more normal uh, HA uh, as well. And so here's a kind of a, a complex slide showing the complex uh, cellular mechanisms and, uh, and uh, communications that happen in the ability of HA uh, injections uh, to reduce inflammation uh, within, within the knee. Again, uh, data here showing uh, that HA injections actually uh, su significantly suppress or reduce uh, matrix metalloproteinase uh, production uh, within uh, the synovial tissue. This was a study uh, done out of LSU Shreveport where they took uh, the different HA products uh, on the market and they challenged uh, the synovium uh, from uh, patients uh, that had uh, synovium biopsied uh, from the knee. They challenged it with IL-1 beta, which is a very strong pro-inflammatory cytokine, then introduced uh, the different HA products and found a significant reduction in MMPs, matrix metalloproteinases, uh, when that tissue was exposed uh, to uh, the hyaluronic acid. Uh, you can see here studies around the lubrication or mechanical aspects uh, around HA, uh, and then additional studies here looking at the impact of HA on uh, subchondral bone and uh, subchondral bone changes. Again, uh, when we look at the dorsal root ganglion and we looked at the impact of HA injections, we see a down regulation. This was a study in an animal model looking at the uh, uh, animal's ability to stand on the limb based on the amount of pain they had. And so the uh, uh, joints that received HA injections were able to tolerate stance, were able to tolerate forces uh, much better uh, than uh, when not receiving uh, HA or the vehicle or the control. So around HAs, there's a fair amount of controversy. So back in 2013, the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons came out with their guidelines and what they found or, or what the evidence suggested is that there are only four treatments that had any evidence uh, to support their use in the management of OA. So exercise, weight loss, NSAIDs, and osteotomy. So as an orthopedic surgeon, the, we begin to struggle because uh, based on these guidelines, really, there's no, treat, there's no treatment option where the evidence conclusively supports its use. 
And so I submit to you, uh, exercise, weight loss, and NSAIDs, most of my patients when they hit my office have actually tried that. So I can't really tell my patients, well, those are really the only treat, three uh, uh, treatment options that I can support or that the evidence supports. And certainly offering osteotomy uh, to our bone and bone, bone patients doesn't really make any sense clinically. If we look at the tried and true uh, treatments that we've got, so steroid injections are, are actually uh, neutral. So there's actually uh, no definitive evidence to support uh, their use. And if you look at opiate use, actually uh, the uh, WOS guidelines actually have a neutral recommendation on usage of opiates uh, for management of NeoA, right? So we know that these recommendations are in the process of, of being evaluated as we speak, and the new guidelines should be coming out uh, shortly. But nonetheless, the guidelines currently that are in play are these, and the HA injections actually had a negative recommendation. So you can see the science supporting what we do is actually uh, pretty limited and, and fa fairly sparse. And really the only three treatments that are supported by the science would be the three treatments that really are impractical when the patient hits my office. And so uh, there's a lot of uh, discrepancy between the specialty organizations uh, that are out there. So the ACR or the American College of Rheumatology uh, recently uh, came out with their guidelines. And what they found was a choice to, the, to use hyaluronic acid injections in neo patients who have had inadequate response to non-pharmacologic therapies, topical and oral NSAIDs and intraarticular steroids may be viewed more favorably than offering no intervention. So again, a little different than, than what the orthopedic surgeons say. If we look at ARC, which is a federally funded agency, what they found was HA improves functions, health-related quality of life, and may delay total knee replacement in the Medicare patients, so patients that are 65 and older. If we look at the American Medical Society for Sports Medicine, they recommend the use of HA for appropriate patients with NEOA. The Eurovisc group uh, unanimously agreed visco supplementation is effective treatment for mild to moderate NEOA. And so there's a lot of discrepancy between the specialty organizations around the use of uh, HA injections uh, in NEOA. Uh, so you can really find uh, differences in interpretation of the science depending on who you ask and, and where you go. Um, so if we look at some of the science that's out there, what do we see? So this is a study uh, published by Dr. McClendon, one of the uh, kind of foremost uh, uh, outcomes researchers in the arthritis space. And what they found was the intraarticular benefit of HA and the treatment appropriateness. So in patients uh, without comorbidities, uh, what they found uh, was the appropriateness of HAs here uncertain. Uh, and then uh, but they found that it should be conditionally uh, recommended, uh, but in these patients here, multi-joint uh, type OA or multi-joint OA, uh, it's not necessarily appropriate, but it's not approved in the US uh, for management outside the knee. So really when we look at the data uh, in terms of knee OA only, you can see they've got a, a conditionally uh, a recommendation here. So one of the other challenges around a knee OA is uh, the kelligan lawrence scale. So the kelligan lawrence scale is how we uh, assess disease severity. Uh, grade four is bone on bone patients. Grade zero is basically a healthy uh, looking knee. And then uh, obviously uh, the different gradations uh, between, you know, mild to moderate knee OA is really uh, grade twos and threes. Uh, and then grade four is uh, uh, bone on bone. And the challenge with this is they only use a standing AP knee x-ray. No merchant or sunrise view. So you can't tell if there's any patellofemoral OA and no notch view or tunnel view. So you, you really, uh, in studies that use the KL score, may be including a lot of patients with more severe disease uh, and really skewing the data. And so a lot of the guidelines, especially WS guidelines, were based on studies that use the KL score and didn't really screen out uh, the more severe patients. So you can really hone in on who the patients uh, are responding uh, to uh, NEOA. Um, but with the later studies or the newer studies, you're really starting them to pay more attention into the types of x-rays that they're getting and really not include KL4 patients and really focus on the KL2 uh, and 3 patients. So it's confusing, but, you know, we have to synthesize all this information the best we can to try to deliver the best options uh, for our patients. 
So what are the different uh, HA treatments that are out there? So typically there are single injections versus uh, multiple injections and the multiple injections can be weekly uh, from three to five weeks. There's some newer ones that are actually uh, two injections, uh, one a week for two weeks. They're also divided into low molecular weight versus high molecular weight. To get to high molecular weight, usually you have to manipulate uh, the HA molecule to a certain extent. Some of the older HA products that are out there really manipulated the molecule uh, to a big extent uh, and patients would develop an allergic or immunologic re reaction to that. The newer HA uh, single injections that are out there, high molecular weight injections that are out there, manipulate, manipulate the molecule a lot less so the body doesn't see it as being abnormal. And then there's avian versus non-avian HA injections. There's a lot of interest in the newer products moving to non-avian uh, uh, products because it's easier to purify. You don't have as much contamination uh, with the avian derived uh, products that are out there. So if you look internationally in terms of the uh, HA injections that are out there, there's a fair number of these injections uh, all over the world, uh, but the ones uh, that are uh, highlighted here with the arrow are the single injection uh, uh, treatments that are most uh, available uh, here in the U.S. and you can see the ones here uh, that are FDA approved uh, on this list. So when we look at the data uh, comparing uh, single injection uh, HA products to multi-injection uh, products, this is uh, one of the studies uh, that did that. So this is a study out of China comparing a single injection uh, HA product called Duralane uh, to uh, multi-injection five injection series uh, called ARTS or SUPARTS, which is kind of the, the grandfather of the HA injections uh, on the market. And what they did was a non-inferiority non study to see how the single injection stacks up to uh, uh, five weekly injections of another HA products. Again, you can see here, uh, you're starting to see in the research that they're excluding the patients with bone on bone uh, OA in our research. And we're really focusing on the patients with mild to moderate uh, knee OA. Uh, and you had to see that the patients needed to have some baseline characteristics in order to be included in the study. So what was the study design here? They received five weekly injections of Suparts. Uh, in the group that got the Duralane, they got one uh, Duralane and then kind of four sham uh, injections weekly uh, thereafter. You can see 160 or so patients in each arm. Um, study duration was 26 weeks. And the uh, variables of interest were Womack pain and function, which are kind of the classic uh, pain and function scores in the NEOA literature. And then we are starting to see a lot of interest in responder rates. So not only are we looking for something that's statistically significant, but we want to start understanding if the results are clinically meaningful as well. And so what did they find? They found basically no difference uh, between the Suparts group uh, and the Duralane group. So they established or they helped establish that the single injection uh, products are just as good as the multi-injection products uh, that were on the market. And so you can see uh, the responder rate. So not only statistically significant, but clinically significant improvement, uh, both in the single injection group uh, compared to the multi-injection group uh, that you see here. The other thing uh, that I pay attention to in a lot of these studies is the use of rescue medications. So it's one thing to circle pain scores and uh, functional scores on a sheet of paper. It's another thing to monitor what the patients are feeling by figuring out what rescue medications they're using. So it's actually an interesting variable to monitor and pay attention to. And what you found was no difference uh, in the Duralane group in the, compared to the Suparts group in terms of rescue medication uh, usage as well and the adverse events as expected uh, would be low uh, with these treatments. So again, uh, a fair number of single injection uh, products uh, that are on the market, and you can start to see, uh, we're seeing a lot more uh, interest in, uh, especially in the newer treatments that are out there uh, in non-avian formulations compared to the avian formulations in the past. So I was part of a study uh, group trying to figure out, you know, because the science was somewhat limited, can we uh, start figuring out to the best uh, that ability that we can based on whatever uh, literature was available, uh, you know, what are some of the practical applications for the HA products, uh, HA treatments that are out there? So we came up with a lot of these different clinical scenarios that a lot of us see kind of in the real world. And based on the science and our uh, expert consensus, we felt that these were kind of the three products uh, or three uh, scenarios uh, where uh, HA really had both expert consensus and literature or science to, to support their use. And then uh, in these following categories felt that, you know, uh, it was unclear with the literature and us as clinicians 
uh, that have knowledge in the space were also unsure you know, whether uh, these HA injections are appropriate uh, or useful in those scenarios. So this is a nice head-to-head uh, -head study uh, taking the scientific literature that's out there uh, to compare uh, steroid injections to HA injections, since steroid injections are kind of our tried and true uh, treatment. And what they found was steroid injections actually win early on, which makes sense, and that's what we see clinically. But as time goes on, steroid injections wear off uh, very quickly, but we see a sustained benefit in the HA injections uh, over time, out to 26 weeks, uh, compared to steroid injections. So we did a uh, health economics study because I also want to look at this from the perspective of a payer or someone that's taking risk in, in management, uh, 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 the payment, managing the payments uh, of Neoway. And so what we did uh, was we used a uh, administrative claims database and we looked at all the patients that had a knee replacement. And then we looked backwards to see how long it took from the time of diagnosis until they had a knee replacement as a function of the number of HA injections that they had. And so what we found was up to five course treatment, a 3.6 year reduction or delay in time to knee replacement compared to the patients that did not receive HA injections. So again, these are patients with significant disease and how long did it take to get a knee replacement? And we were able, or at least the data shows that there's a correlation between uh, HA injections and time to knee replacement. So there's a lot of data and a lot of interest uh, looking at what are the best treatment options uh, for Neoway. And it'd be almost impossible to design the perfect randomized control trial, right? Because we'd have to have 10 different arms. We'd have to follow these patients out for a long period of time and hope that they didn't cross over or have all other issues. And so from a big, big data perspective, it's impossible to design a, a randomized study or a level one study to answer that fundamental question. So we have to start using or employing big data principles uh, to try to figure out what the best treatments are. And that's what we call a network meta-analysis. So this was a study done by Dr. Banneru to, to start using kind of these newer big data principles to try to understand what the optimal treatment options are uh, for NEOA. So he took 137 randomized clinical trials and he separated them out to the, uh, within the different treatment arms. So you can see all the different treatment arms within all of those RCTs. And I submit that this is probably uh, uh, covers uh, the, the breadth of different treatment comparisons that we would shoot for, right? So steroids versus placebo, Tylenol versus naproxen, naproxen versus HA injection, so on and so forth. And so graphically, this is what it looks like. And so the bigger the circle, the more uh, patients uh, th that had that treatment arm in all these studies. The challenge is how do we compare naproxen to ibuprofen and Celebrex to ibuprofen, right? So what we have to do is see how naproxen behaves with these other treatments, how Celebrex behaves with these other treatments uh, where there's overlap with Motrin. And then we try to figure out what that comparison is to ibuprofen, uh, to Celebrex and uh, naproxen. And so that's what a network meta-analysis does is it employs these correlations, these big data principles to try to figure out uh, how different variables behave when there's no direct uh, comparison. And what did they find? What they found, generally speaking, is injections performed better uh, than uh, pills. And of the pills, diclofenac had a better efficacy than all the other treatments. The other thing I want to point out is intraarticular placebo, so saline, actually did better than Tylenol. Okay, so that's interesting. I want you to digest that for a minute. Of the injections, what they found is HA injections perform better uh, than steroid injections. So how is this that an intraarticular placebo actually perform better than Tylenol? We've all taken Tylenol. I've taken Tylenol. It works. It's useful. So how is it that a placebo doesn't do, uh, performs better than Tylenol? Well, let's kind of dissect this a little bit. What is an intraarticular placebo? It's actually injection of saline into the joint. So is intraarticular placebo actually a placebo? So this was actually a, a picture of a, a knee scope that I did. So this is the same patient. This is looking in the suprapatellar pouch and you can see the synovitis in the suprapatellar pouch. So I took a quick picture of this and I went and did my treatment, you know, debris, the meniscus, what have you. I came back to that same exact spot and look at what I found. The synovitis was completely gone. 
Now, I didn't do anything to this tissue. I didn't touch it. I didn't do anything other than look at it. So what happened during those 5, 10, 15 minutes? All we did was we flushed saline through the knee in this area, right? I didn't actively do anything to this tissue. So what does that tell you? When saline is actually introduced into the knee, it actually can change the biology. It can actually change the synovitis in the joint. So intraarticular placebo here actually did something. It's actually considered an active control. So it's not actually a placebo in the traditional sense that we think like a sugar pill. So when you look at the older science and when you look at the older research, they actually used intraarticular saline as their control group and called it a placebo and didn't actually adjust or control for it. So if we start looking at intraarticular placebo as not a placebo, as actually something that's doing something, and we try to control for it, what do we find? Well, this was a study that actually did that. And so what they found was when you don't control for the impact of intraarticular saline, these are the results that you find. Intraarticular steroids, HA injection, high molecular weight versus uh, uh, low molecular weight, but when you control for the placebo effect, quote unquote, right, intraarticular saline is actually does something. And when you control for that effect, look at what you find. All of a sudden, what traditionally was considered not working actually shows that it's working, right? So you have to do the science. You have to do the appropriate statistics. You have to understand what's going on in order to meaningfully interpret the data that's out there. So this is the most recent study that we did. We did a, uh, we used the Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, database, and we looked to see uh, the impact of steroid injections versus HA injections on their impact on adverse outcomes, health economics, the total cost of care in a group of 46 million patients within the Blue Cross Blue Shield database. And what we found was a significant reduction in adverse events or a correlation uh, with a reduction in adverse events in the HA uh, patients within the Blue Cross Blue Shield database compared to the steroid patients. But what was really intriguing or what was really interesting is the impact of HA injections on pain and actually more importantly, opiates. So when we looked at the total knee replacement patients compared to steroid patients compared to the HA patients in the Blue Cross Blue Shield database, what we found was a huge uh, increase in opioid use in the total knee replacements in the first year, as expected, that's intuitive. You had surgery, a big surgery, I would expect a huge amount of opiate use. But look what happens after year one. The opiate use in the total knee replacement patient actually drops to the level of the HA group. The steroid patients actually have a higher opioid use compared to the total knee replacement patients and the HA patients, right? So in this era of this opioid epidemic that's really a national emergency right now. You can see what's going on with the difference uh, in utilization of steroids uh, versus HA. And in fact, HA injections are actually reaching the level of total knee replacement in terms of opiate use, uh, and certainly much better uh, than steroids using this. And so what does this mean in terms of dollars and cents? So we take into account uh, 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 opiate use, uh, adverse events and all of this, look at what we see, a significant reduction in costs and healthcare utilization in the HA group compared to the steroid group. And as expected, uh, total knee replacement uh, would be significantly higher. So that's, if you will, our control. We would expect total knee replacement higher. So that kind of helps internally validate uh, that this data makes sense. And you can see a significant reduction in costs and healthcare utilization in the HA group uh, compared to the steroid group. So when it comes to it from a payer's perspective, you know, uh, and payers that uh, don't wanna cover HAs or struggle uh, to allow their physicians uh, to, cover, uh, to use HA injections on their patients, you start to wonder if this is a penny wise, uh, pound foolish mentality. So again, a uh, significant uh, difference in improvement in the HA patients uh, compared to uh, the uh, steroid and total knee patients knee replacement patients, uh, no matter how you slice it. So in conclusion, uh, there are num uh, numerous uh, non-operative uh, interventions for the treatment of knee OA. Recent studies suggest that steroid injections 
within three months of performing joint replacement uh, may increase uh, a risk of infection, which we need to be uh, leery of and sensitive to. Uh, many now uh, recommend uh, waiting three months after their uh, last uh, serial injections uh, before performing a total knee replacement. Um, we know HA has been shown to be an effective non-operative treatment and single injection HAs uh, can be as effective as multi-injection uh, HAs uh, in the past. With that, uh, I will pause and thank you for your time. Hopefully you enjoyed learning a little bit more about osteoarthritis, hyaluronic acid, and the various treatment options that we have. So time now for the Q&A section. We've got a button at the bottom of the screen, Q&A chat function. So you can see some of the questions that are starting to come in. And for those of you that are audio only, I'll go ahead and read the questions uh, and see if we can provide some helpful answers. Most of the questions that are coming in are very practical questions, kind of day-to-day, -day, how to manage HA injections, how to manage OA, uh, just kind of how, how do I make our lives and our patients' lives go a little more smoothly. So the first question is, what's your thought on using a combination of HA injection and steroid injection one to two weeks apart to help manage pain? So I think in terms of pure uh, labeling and FDA indications, steroids and HA injections are not meant to be mixed. But what we do find from a practical perspective in real world is depending on the HA injections, a lot of physicians have to use steroids because some of the HA preparations that are out there are actually uh, cross-linked to such an extent that they actually create an immunologic or allergic reaction uh, when you use it. So look at the HA products that use some of the older uh, uh, high molecular weight HAs, those that were you know, 10, 15, 20 years old, um, have a significant amount of cross-linking. And so when you cross-link that molecule to that extent, it creates a, a fairly prolific uh, allergic or immunologic response in some patients, otherwise known as pseudosepsis or uh, acute, uh, systemic or acute uh, inflammatory response. And so in those instances, what physicians have done over time is they've realized that this is a problem. And so they'll either pre-medicate with steroids, uh, add steroids a day of, or then chase it with steroids a week or two later if the patient has that kind of prolific uh, allergic response. A lot of the products do not have that reaction uh, because they're either not cross-linked in the same way or not cross-linked at all. And so that's something to be aware of. And that may be what that uh, 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 listener is referring to is using steroids with, that are kind of injection specific where they almost have to use steroids because of the way the molecule was designed. So take a look at the products that you use currently and just ensure that they're not uh, kind of the older uh, highly cross-linked molecules uh, which uh, really create the need to use steroids when you, in my opinion, I try to reserve steroids for really severe bone-on-bone -bone patients and not use them necessarily in patients with mild to moderate knee OA. Next question is, what is the recommendation on how often HA injections can be used in a 12-month period? Uh, insurance will approve or cover HA injection once a year. If a patient is willing to pay for the injection out of pocket, then what is the appropriate time to repeat the injection? So most of the data that's out there really goes out to six months and HA injections, you know, formally, as far as the FDA goes, uh, show efficacy out to six months. Now that's not to say you can't use your clinical judgment and feel that, you know, if the patient, uh, the clinical scenario warrants uh, using them more frequently or less frequently that you can do it. The only issue is who's going to pay for it. So insurance companies in general, some of them will only pay for it every six months. And if you want to use it more frequently, then it's the patient's decision and your decision, number one, to use it more frequently. And then number two, if the insurance denies it, uh, then uh, up to the patient if they want to pay out of pocket. So again, remember the insurance company is not telling you you can or cannot use it. What they're saying is we're only going to pay for it within this time frame. So in your clinical judgment, if you feel that it's appropriate uh, to use these injections more frequently, then you just you and the patient just simply have to decide uh, who's going to pay for it because the insurance is only going to pay for it uh, every six months or there uh, or around that. But again, you have to look specifically at that clinical scenario uh, and the patient's insurance plan. So next question is, what is your thought on physicians who use HA therapy after total knee replacement? So again, there's no data, no science to really support its use uh, in and or around uh, total knee replacement. 
my personal opinion is any intraarticular uh, injection done with metal and plastic in the vicinity uh, has the potential to cause infection. And I think uh, for most orthopedic surgeons that may be listening, a infection in a total joint replacement is an absolute disaster. So you have to really decide uh, and have an informed decision-making process with the patient to understand what the consequences are, what the risks and benefits are of doing an injection in the vicinity of an implant or prosthesis. And in my opinion and in my clinical practice, I don't think the risk of developing infection uh, is worth uh, any potential benefit from an HA injection around a total knee replacement. But again, I want to be clear, there is no science uh, that you can fall back on uh, to justify that. So that's simply going to have to be uh, a clinical decision you make and a risk that you're willing to take. Uh, because at this point in time, uh, there's no science uh, to really help you one way or another. Next question is, what, what do you, if one injection does not seem to help the patient, what do, you, what do you do, I think, if one injection does not seem to help the patient? Can you give another one within a certain amount of time? Um, absolutely. So, you know, not all injections are created equal. Uh, different injections have uh, different molecular weights, different concentrations, different volumes, uh, different levels of purity. Um, so I think, you, again, in your clinical judgment, you're absolutely, just like any other drug, right? Uh, when we look at diabetes or hypertension or any other treatment that we do, we have a number of different options. And if one option doesn't necessarily work, then we go on to another one. So, you know, I think it's your clinical judgment. And I think, you know, an NSAID, for example, you know, some patients get more better relief with Aleve, some get better relief with Advil, others with ibuprofen, right? And so I think you can use that same thought process uh, where if one injection doesn't work, is it reasonable to try a different one? Absolutely. Um, they're all a little different and they all may work differently. And especially if you look at the high molecular, higher molecular weight injections, compared to the lower molecular weight injections, there's absolutely differences uh, in, in how those injections perform. So again, uh, you know, you may want to decide also that maybe there was a, a technique issue, right? Maybe you didn't get in the joint, which is why it didn't work. And so we're blaming the injection as opposed to the provider or uh, the technical aspect. Again, as providers and physicians, uh, we, we really dislike looking in the mirror and, and thinking that maybe it was our issue and not the product or devices issue, right? And so, you know, you're not perfect 100% of the time. So maybe uh, there is an opportunity to try it again or use a different uh, injection as well. So I think there's a lot of variables that come into play if a particular injection doesn't work as to why uh, it didn't work. Um, can you give another within a certain uh, amount of time? So again, absolutely. I think in your clinical judgment, if you feel uh, that, uh, uh, giving an injection in a short period of time, patient got benefit, and you think another one uh, may help, you know, then uh, that's between you and the patient. But again, you have to be sensitive to the insurance and the payment process and whether or not it's going to be a reimbursed. And if it's not going to be a reimbursed, then it's a, a question uh, with the patient of whether they'd be willing uh, to pay out of pocket. Um, please comment on, you, on the use of HA in the shoulder and hip. So again, in the U.S., in the United States, HA injections are only FDA approved uh, to be used in the knee. If you choose to use it in the United States on shoulder and hip, it is off-label, and you have to have that appropriate discussion uh, with the patient uh, about the risk and benefits of that, and they probably won't be covered uh, by the insurance, and so the patient will have to pay out of pocket, so that's an entirely different discussion uh, that you have to have with them. Now, internationally, Canada and other places, it is approved and on label to be used uh, for the hip uh, and the shoulder. And in those uh, international locations, uh, then uh, it's appropriate and uh, is justified and actually approved uh, to be done so. Are there any other upcoming treatments technologies uh, to look out for? So there are a number of developments in the OA space that I think are uh, interesting uh, to look out for. There's a lot of interest I think probably a lot of people recognize PRP, stem cells, uh, placental tissue, uh, a lot of work being done. The data and the science around it is still uh, controversial. Uh, most of the position statements by the specialty societies still do not endorse uh, these injections uh, necessarily because the science really is all over the place. It's been poorly done, 
not well controlled. You, you'll hear these anecdotal stories or these small case series of how well patients are doing. So right now, for the most part, it's a cash only uh, out of pocket expense. Um, there is data to support its use, but the robustness of the data uh, and the evidence around that data is, is still has a long way to go. Um, other uh, new innovations uh, and opportunities that are coming out for management of OA are targeting uh, the nerves around the knee, the geniculate nerves, the superficial or deep geniculate nerves, whether it's burning them or freezing them. Uh, a lot of interest in the pain management space or interventional orthopedic space uh, around uh, managing uh, knee OA pain by targeting the sensory nerves. So again, uh, that treatment doesn't address the basic biology. It's simply hiding uh, the pain uh, surrounding uh, the pathology. Uh, but for a lot of patients, maybe those patients that have severe bone on bone knee OA uh, that aren't candidates for arthroplasty or aren't candidates for surgery, maybe too young, too old, too unhealthy, morbidly obese, what have you, uh, those may be potential options uh, targeting the geniculars, superficial or deep, burning or freezing uh, to help manage uh, the pain in conjunction with other treatments. And I don't think there's a single silver bullet. I think what it is is a, a combination of treatments, an ecosystem of treatments where you dial some stuff up, dial some stuff down. That's not to say you can't use steroids and freeze the nerves, or you can't use HA and burn the nerves or what have you. Uh, there's a lot of interest in bracing. So neuromuscular electrical stimulation, NMES uh, bracing, some data out there where if you stimulate the quads, uh, and improve the strength of the quads and the thigh muscles that knee OA pain uh, can be mitigated and maybe reduced as well. So I think it's combining different solutions uh, based on the needs of the patient to get them the optimal outcome uh, that they're looking for. And ultimately, obviously, surgery is on the table as well, but obviously it's expensive, a uh, fair amount of risk, especially compared to these non-operative uh, treatments. Uh, but we are, our toolbox is growing, our armamentarium is growing, uh, there's a lot of uh, new innovations coming out. So be on the lookout for that uh, because uh, I think the paradigm is definitely changing. Uh, given that there are so many uh, different brands of gels, do you normally start with one specific brand? How do you choose high versus low HA uh, concentration or molecular weight? So again, there are a number of different HA products that are out there. I think you have to use your clinical judgment. What we're typically seeing is a shift away from avian-based uh, HA injections uh, to non-avian, and typically those are uh, bacterially uh, derived. Uh, again, remember HA is a very unique molecule. It's one of the few molecules that's completely preserved across all animal species. So whether you're a worm, a chicken, a bacteria, or a human, we can move that molecule between species without a problem so long as we can purify it and the body doesn't look at it as being abnormal. So if you have uh, uh, contaminants or proteins attached to it, uh, then the body potentially can react to it. So because of that, I think there's been a shift by a lot of the manufacturers to move away from avian-based to non-avian-based uh, uh, products. And so with that uh, comes less uh, uh, purity issues and the ability to kind of move it between species uh, with less of a problem. So that's one aspect uh, to look at. Now, low molecular weight versus high molecular weight or cross-linked HAs. I think uh, there's a lot of interest in single injection HAs. Uh, predominantly, I think efficacy potentially, if you look at some of the products, uh, the length of impact is longer than some of the older uh, high molecular weight uh, products that are out there. But also I think convenience, so patient convenience. Do you bring uh, the patient back uh, one, just one time uh, and so they can, if they're working, uh, get back to work, it's less time off work or bring them back weekly for three weeks or five weeks. I know in my practice, uh, especially my young working patients, if I do one injection a week for five weeks, you know, that means they have to take a lot of time off work. You know, and unfortunately I'm not necessarily running on time. And so maybe an, I'm an hour behind or something. So if you think about it from a working uh, uh, person's perspective, they've got to take sick leave, right? So maybe they try to schedule your appointment around lunchtime. Uh, so maybe they have the time off, maybe not. Maybe they got to take an entire afternoon just to get one injection for five straight weeks. You know, that's an inconvenience to the patient. So I've got a lot of my, especially my younger working patients that ask for the single injection uh, products purely because just from a practical perspective, uh, they're working and they can't get the time off. And then you layer COVID on top of this, they have no more sick leave, right? They have no more annual leave. They had to burn it all. Or some of the companies are, are forcing their employees uh, to use their, their time off. And so, you know, I think the dynamics of healthcare are changing. The needs of the patients are changing. So I think the convenience uh, and the efficiency that the single injections afford, especially uh, for some of our patients is important. 
Another factor to consider are patients that may be paying out of pocket or fixed income that have straight Medicare, right? For them, you know, price may be important. So the cost of the HA injections, uh, if they're going to pay cash, may be important to your patients. And so there are some older products that are out there where that may be priced uh, more competitively for the patients that are looking for uh, uh, cost effectiveness uh, versus convenience. So I think there are a lot of factors, practical factors that come into which HA products you use, when you use them, how you use them, why you use them based on the needs of the patients. Um, and then you have to marry that with the science uh, and the efficacy data that's out there, the safety data that's out there. So it's not really a clear cut answer that I can give, but I will tell you, you know, some of the companies that are out there have, uh, have offer very convenient uh, uh, HA packages, if you will, kind of one-stop shopping, if you will. So I would kind of look out uh, for that, uh, that offer kind of the breadth, because again, from an office practice management perspective, uh, we like uh, really working with companies that kind of offer it all, uh, one-stop shopping, so we can have all the different varieties of HA products, so we can uh, really fine-tune and personalize uh, the treatment plan uh, for our individual patients. So I'd, I encourage you to kind of look for uh, those companies uh, that offer that uh, ability. Um, let's see, where does PRP uh, stem cells uh, fit in your algorithm? So again, as I mentioned earlier, uh, those uh, uh, treatment options uh, are cash-based uh, options. And so for a lot of my uh, patients, it's not, especially my fixed income Medicare patients, they're not really an option. But if my patients can afford those treatment options, I, I think it's 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 an opportunity for them. I make sure they understand that the science is really unclear, doesn't really support their use one way or another. And so if they can afford to spend the money and they want to try it, uh, there's very little harm and I'm okay with offering it or doing it. Uh, but again, I take a lot of time to explain to the patients that the science really is not there and they have to be prepared that spending that money uh, will not uh, get the results that they necessarily hope for or expect. But if they're willing to take that chance and willing to take that risk, then it's their money and they can certainly uh, have that option if they want. So with that, uh, I don't see too many other questions uh, on our list. I think that was the last question. So we will uh, end uh, this portion of the program. Thank you for your time.